Hello, in this video I'm going to demonstrate making a paperback book cover using Adobe Photoshop. And I'm using a template that I generated in Amazon KDP. They have a very convenient tool you can use to plug in the size of the book, in this case 6 inches by 9 inches, and the, the number of pages in the interior so that it can calculate the spine width. And then it generates this nice file that you can open directly in Photoshop and the, all, all the sizes will be correct and everything for you. If you are using a different print-on-demand service um, like Lulu, they might not give you a nice template like this. They might just give you dimensions that you need to follow. So if you need to adjust those, you can do so under image and canvas size. Um, just by opening up this template, it's already set to 12.7 inches width and 9.25 inches of height. And this includes all of the bleeds um, that are necessary. So I'll point out some things about this template. Uh, it describes exactly on there what each thing means. The black dotted line is the trim size. So this is where the machine is going to cut down the printed images um, and those will be the nice pretty sides of the book. Everything beyond that point is your bleed. So if you want images and colors to extend to the edge of the cover, which you almost certainly do, um, you want to make sure they go all the way to the edge here so that there's a little extra that gets cut off and you won't have any little white slivers of ugliness on the side of the book. You'll see the red or orange tinge extends inside the line as well. And this is sort of a margin of error or variance because printing is never exact. It's never perfectly along the lines. Papers shift, machines are going really fast. So things can shift left or right or up or down during the printing process. So don't, if you put anything important in here that you really want people to see, it could get lost or it could wrap around into the spine when you didn't intend it to. So make sure all of your content is within the white area. Down here is the barcode placement um, that is default for Amazon KDP. They don't expect you to put an image of your own ISBN barcode right here. Some services like Lulu do. They provide the, the image and you have to put it in yourself. For KDP, you just have to make sure this rectangle, um, there's nothing there that you need people to see because they're going to pop the barcode right on top and hide everything that's behind it. So the very first thing we're going to do in this file before I start making anything pretty, although I'm really excited to make something pretty, I'm going to check our color mode. So under image and mode, you'll see we're by default using RGB color, which is what you want to use when you're making graphic images for the web. But we're not. We are making things for print. We're making a paperback cover. So we're going to select CMYK color. It will say you're about to convert to a different profile. Is this the one you want? Say yes. And now we're working in CMYK. Now what you see on your screen will never look exactly like what comes out of the printer because this is light that's coming directly out and a print cover is like bouncing off which is different. It's different physics. It's just going to look different um, but you can do your best by selecting the correct color mode CMYK and this will approximate what's what it's going to look like in print. And before we do anything else I'm going to lock my layer here. First I'm going to rename my layer template because you're going to start making a lot of layers here and you might think when you're making that rectangle you'll know exactly which rectangle it is you won't have any problems then the next thing you know you have 10 different rectangles all over the place and you don't know which one is referring to that one you want to select so it's good practice to always rename your layers i will probably forget while making this video and i will move on without renaming my layers and i will regret it layer later because that's just my habit. But you should do as I say and not what I do and rename your layers so that you can understand them. Now I'm going to lock this layer because if I don't, if I were to put some text here and then I try to grab it and move it, I could accidentally start moving my template around. And I don't want that. I want it to stay in place because it tells me where I need to place things. So I will hit this icon. Template is now locked. I can't move it. And that's exactly what I want to happen. I want nothing to happen. So we're good. Now we can finally start on the pretty. And to start, I'm going to insert a background 
for my whole cover. Now it could just be, uh, it could use a rectangle, I could fill it with color, but I like to have a little texture, a little interest in my backgrounds. So I found an image online and I'm going to place it here to use as my background. And you have two placement options in Photoshop. One is embedded and one is linked. Embedded means the whole image is going to be imported into this Photoshop document as it is. And then any changes you make to it are done only in this Photoshop document. Linked is if you want the file to exist elsewhere on your machine and you want to be able to edit it in a different program and have those changes be reflected here in your Photoshop document. So that's really useful if you're making an illustration um, in Adobe Illustrator or a painting in Krita or something and you want to make those changes in another file and you don't want to re-import them later, you can place it linked. But for the purposes of this demo, I'm just going to do embedded because I don't need to do any editing in the future. And I'm using this backdrop that I found in Pixabay. I just searched for watercolor painting, I think, and it came up with this texture, which I think looks pretty nice. And I'll place it as it is. Now, I could copy it so that it fills this whole thing, but I'm instead going to rotate it so that it's a landscape orientation. And I can do that by going to Edit, Transform, and rotate clockwise. And now I want to resize it so that it fills this whole canvas. And I can do that by going up to Edit Free Transform, or I can hit Control T, which I'll probably do later. And then I can click and drag and position it however I want. Now when you do any sort of transformation, you have to click the check mark at the very top. Otherwise, uh, Photoshop will yell at you. It will go ding, but it won't tell you exactly what you did wrong if you try to click something else. You always have to hit the check mark. So now I have this backdrop here, and I think it looks very pretty, but it's not the best choice as a background cover as it is because I'm going to start putting text on here. And this is very saturated. It has a lot of variants. It has dark shadows, light highlights, and it's quite busy. So as soon as you start putting like the text, um, the promotional text, the blurbs, whatever you want on your back cover, it's probably going to get lost and not be readable. And covers should always be readable. I know some people like covers that look pretty and you can't read them, but then how are you supposed to know what it is if you've never seen it before? So I am going to make some modifications to this so that it makes a better background for this project. And one thing I like to do is play with all the adjustments available. So uh, brightness and contrast, I could reduce the contrast so the highlights aren't so light and the shadows aren't so shadowy. And I could adjust curves. This allows you to play with highlights and shadows and mid-tones for each color. So um, I will not do this permanently, but see we have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So if I want, you can see the curve for cyan is, um, there's a lot of highlights there. If I want to reduce those, I can do that. If I want to increase the magenta shadows, I can do that, or the magenta highlights, I can do that. But I don't actually want to do that for this project, so I'm going to delete that layer. That was just a demo. What I'm going to use for this project is hue and saturation, because I'd like to sort of flatten out the colors and the variations here in this. So I'm going to hit the colorize box. And this allows you to sort of apply a wash of color across the whole thing. And I'm thinking I want a nice dark teal color. You can make it more saturated, less saturated. I don't want it to be too saturated, but I do want it to have nice color. And then I want to make it darker, so I'll use the lightness slider here. And I think that looks pretty good. So one thing I want to do before I move on is make sure that this which is now the saturation background is applied to this, which is just the background layer. Because you'll see if I turn this off, this is applying to everything that's beneath it, including the template. And if I want to be able to see the template as it is with all my, my colors, 
um, I want to make sure that this is applying to this and not to the template. Um, and it might not be such a big deal now. I mean, so the template is a little bit colored, but you can still see everything on it. But when you start layering different adjustments on top of each other, it will get, get very complicated very quickly. So I'm going to right click and hit create clipping mask. And now you can see this little arrow. This is applied only to this background layer. If I turn this background layer off, no blue tint, which is exactly what I want. Okay, I'm going to lock this background in place just like I did the template so that I don't move it around accidentally. And I'm going to insert an image of a rose here because I like pretty things and roses are pretty. So I will place embedded again and I'll use my rose that I also found from Pixabay. I'll just place it as it is here and modify it and move it around later. So this image, like most images, came with a background on it. Unless it's pre-processed, um, which this was pre-processed to put this background on it, but a lot of the time it's not. So to get rid of this background, I'll start out by making sure the rose is selected. That's my rose. And I'm going to select, oh, we want contiguous, otherwise you'll see it's, mm, it's trying to select colors that are inside there. And just selecting around, getting rid of this background. Now, if you haven't used Photoshop much before, you might be tempted to simply hit delete. And that would get rid of the image. Although technically this is a smart object right now, so it wouldn't, it would yell at you. But if it were a rasterized image and you hit delete, it would go away. So I can demonstrate that here. Delete, and there, you've accomplished what you wanted. However, this is destructive. So this image now is lacking all of that. And what if you didn't like it later? What if you noticed that this little part of the leaf was missing and you went to undo that um, or you notice that you hadn't quite gotten this, and then you have to go back in and do that. Um, so you don't want to make destructive changes in Photoshop because you don't have to. We'll go back by using the history panel right there. I still have all of this background selected. So instead of just deleting it and um, messing up my original image, I'm going to create a mask. and because I had all of this selected and all of this not selected, um, it created a mask to hide everything that wasn't selected. And you can see in this little thumbnail that shows the mask, the uh, black part is over the rose and the white part, which is what you will see and is not transparent, um, is around the rose. I want that to be the other way around. So I'm going to go to image, adjustments, and invert. You can also hit control I and that will flip those two around. So now I have a nice mask that is showing the rows and hiding the background. And what's good about this is I can zoom in and by using my paint tools, I can fix these little issues if I am feeling really picky. And this is just a tutorial, so I shouldn't be too picky here, but if I have this open, I'm on black, okay? So if I start doing this, I'm going to be um, adding more to the mask and therefore hiding more in the rows. If I switch these, I can easily click that to switch these two. I'm now painting with white, so I can restore some of this leaf, which is pretty nifty. That way I don't have to mess with my selection tools. Okay, now I'm going to zoom back out because I don't want to spend forever on that. I have my rose, select, rose layer selected. I'm going to control T to transform it and I'm going to make it smaller and put it right there. Yeah. And I'll check against my background to see where I'm putting it. I'm putting it right there. Okay. 
turn the thermometer back around, back on. So this looks interesting because they clearly photoshopped it. That's not how roses grow. They don't have yellow petals here and purple petals there. Uh, I might not necessarily want to have all these colors. One thing I like to do is check out um, the blending options here because you can get some really interesting effects by playing with these. And so um, that one looks pretty cool. It's sort of fading into the background in some areas and standing out in some others. That one will just burn it. It looks like it was burned in there. Lighten is an option. Overlay looks pretty cool. So you can get some really interesting effects. Always check these out, or I always check these out, to see if any of them will work for this project. In this case, I don't really care for any of them, so I'm just going to be boring and do another hue and saturation. Colorize it again. We'll create a clipping mask so that we can see it only on the rose, and there I have it, an interesting sepia toned rose. But I want a sort of pink rose, because I feel like it. I like pink. Okay. So there, I have a nice pink rose. Now it's time to put my author and title up there, so I'll use the text tool. Okay. Make sure I'm on the top layer so that when I add a new one, it's added to the top. We have Jane Doe is the author. And um, you'll see in the properties that I have this text that I can adjust, but these settings happen to work for me. And then I'll put the title, The Great American Novel. And that looks pretty funky because I have this set to an absurdly high level. Actually, I just want to say auto. Auto. Okay. And that's much better. And I'll adjust my fonts here. Um, this is not a great way to do it, actually, highlighting specific fonts. It would be better for me to do two separate text boxes and move them independently. But I'm doing this very quickly. Here. I had selected these in advance. I thought there were some nice readable fonts. There we go. And I'll put this in place. Okay. So the title is nice and big um, because you want it to be readable, um, especially since this is a print book that will be sitting on store shelves, hopefully, or on somebody's bookshelf. You want them to be able to see what it is from a good distance. This might be a little too large, but you could always play with that later. And I will quickly switch the color so that I can see these. And yes, this is positioned correctly. It's within my lines. Looks good. So I will undo that color and turn this back on. Now, you can add some interesting effects to your title by using this effects down here. We'll select the right layer. Um, for example, a drop shadow. You can see that created a shadow that is sort of backwards and to the left of the text. You can use this layer style dialog to change that. So I'm currently moving the shadow around I like it to be sort of to the right. You can move it closer to the text, farther away from the text. I think that looks fine. And you can always, if you're not sure whether you like it, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, and then decide whether you like it. So I do not suggest going crazy with these effects because if you start putting shadows and glows and bevels and every which thing that looks nifty, um, You'll end up looking like you used Microsoft Word and just used the word art settings and it will look kind of amateurish. But a few very subtle effects like shadows can help the text pop like that. And another thing that you might see in um, the 
published novels is instead of doing a lot of a text uh, effects on the text itself they will fill the text with an interesting pattern or texture so right now it's just flat white which is fine you can see it but it's not very interesting instead I'm going to fill it with a sort of parchment papery pattern and you can do that a couple of ways first you want to make sure your layer is selected I'm gonna rename my layer while I'm thinking about it front cover title and for text this is especially important because when you start putting the author name here and then you put it there on the spine it's going to look exactly the same they're both going to be called Jane Doe they won't even have like a, a number on it I don't think so you want to put cover author so you know exactly what it is when you when you try to target it so I'm going to have the front cover selected not contiguous I'm using my magic wand tool and I'm selecting the shape of the text and now I'm going to create a new pattern layer with a mask that is exactly the shape of that text and then I can fill it with whatever pattern I want so there's a, a paper I can make it bigger and there I filled it with a pattern you can also do this same technique with um, uh, an image. For example, here's a piece of parchment. I'll just pop it in place. And to copy a mask from one layer to another, you can hit Alt and drag it over there. And there, that has cut out uh, the letters from my parchment background, which I think looks pretty nifty. So it looks like it's cut out of paper and it's um, sort of floating off the page. So I'm going to back out of there. And now it's time to fill in our spine and our background text. So to do that, I'm going to shut off the background so that I can see. I'm going to use black text just for typing. And this is the great American novel. I'm going to make it big enough to see, uh, but you don't want it to be so big that it gets cut off if, if it gets in that variance. And then to turn it, okay, it's selected. I'm actually going to put it up there and rename it um, Spine Tile. And I'm going to edit and rotate it just like I did for the background in the very beginning and put it in place. There you go. That looks good. And then I'll repeat that process for the author. Select a nice readable font. Rotate it and put it in place. Now these should not actually be black, but we can uh, fix that later. And we'll put um, some text by default. Um, I'm just filling, I believe I have an option on to fill this with uh, lorem ipsum by default. And you can put anything you want on the back of the cover. In the uh, paragraphs, window you have the option to justify text which is always a good idea in print it makes things look all lined up and pretty okay and um, you can put blurb up here uh, that you got from another famous author some complimentary text you can put your picture and your bio you can put anything you want on here but for this I'm just gonna leave that here because I don't want to spend forever just making text for you and let's look what that looks like. Now we want these to be white. Okay. Now you can leave this as is and it would look nice. If you want there to be more contrast to make this more readable, let's shut that off again. And I'll put a rectangle in the background just along the spine. I'm 
with no outline. And I'll sh turn this back on. And I want the fill color to be mm, one of these so that it matches pretty well. And this is spine background. This is spine author. And this is back cover description, which we also want to be white. And my spine background ended up over my spine author and title because I wasn't paying attention. But there you go. You have a nice crisp spine that will be readable when it's on the shelf. And I am by profession a librarian, so that is very important to me that you can read spines on the shelf. You have no idea how annoying it is to have bad spines until you have worked in a library. So uh, you can do the same here. You can put a background uh, to increase the contrast, make it more readable. I'm just going to stop here um, because we're already at 26 minutes, which is pretty darn long for a video. And I'm going to show you how to, um, well, actually, I'll just quickly place my sample barcode in there so you can see what the finished product will look like. Drop that there. Okay, so this mocks up what your whole cover is going to look like with more content over here, obviously. Now to export this, you want to make sure all your layers are flat because we have all these lovely named layers and a lot of them have um, some effects on them, some transparencies, like the shadow uh, is slightly transparent. And the printer won't like this. It wants everything to be flat. So what we'll do, should have been saving periodically. We'll save it as a Photoshop document first. This is called Great American Novel. My window popped up in my other screen. And we'll save it as Photoshop so we don't lose all of this. In case you want to come back and make changes later. Okay. Now you want to go and save at, well, first you have layer and then flatten image. Discard in layers, yes, okay. Everything is now in one layer, it's all flat. And then you can go to File, Save As, select the Photoshop PDF, and then it will open another dialog where you can do uh, the settings. Some services might require that you use a very particular um, version of Acrobat. You want to make sure that your image or images are being compressed. Follow your publisher's requirements because they will change. Okay, everything else looks okay. We'll save the PDF. And now, a great American novel. Open in my other window again. This is the PDF that you will upload to the printer. 